<clears throat> Hello everyone. Good afternoon and happy new year. Welcome to the chat show where we talk about empathy, employment and innovation every Wednesday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Today, my guest is Brian Pena, a feature of work philosopher, an amazing, amazing human being and a great entertainer too. So with that, <laughs> Brian, welcome. Welcome thank you, Nish. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I just want to really uh, thank you for not only just having me here, but also the great work that you do at Rangam. It's really thank important you. stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I have learned a lot in last, I think, three months of interaction with you. It has been amazing learning. I know we, we have been connected on LinkedIn for almost uh, three or four years, Elite. but one-on-one uh, -on -one we got connected really well in last three years. So thank you for all the interaction and great, uh, uh, you know, your thought leadership in the area of the uh, future of work and really just amazing uh, thinking what you, you bring uh, to the industry. So thank you for all your great work. Thank um, you. So, so Brian, uh, let's start with, tell us a little bit about you and, and you know, your why, because I, I you know, as I said, a great, one of the great philosopher I have, I have met in this from the staffing industry. And with that, would love to learn about a little bit more about you and, you know, your why. Yeah, thank you. I, I think, um, you know, I, I love the question what my why is. Uh, it, it's so easy. Uh, to forget where we all came from. Everyone has their own origin story. Um, and my origin story is one that I'm very close to because it's a very, um, it, it, it points to a lot of things that I think are important to remember as people pursue their careers and find their, their way in this next way of working specifically. Um, I apologize for that. Hang on, just my phone I should have turned it off. I should know better. But anyway, so, so the, um, so when I, I, I'm, when I first uh, graduated college, I studied economics and theater in college. And uh, I came to LA in uh, 1994 to be an actor. Uh, and through a combination of circumstances, um, I, I did that for a number of years. And through a combination of circumstances, I found myself uh, recovering from a back surgery. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, we were, my, my then uh, wife was pregnant with our, our second child. And uh, I, we were we were broke as can be. Um, out of the blue and through a combination of circumstances, a producer for a movie that I uh, was on uh, remembered my background, uh, had an opening, and sought me out, and eventually took a took a risk, and I got involved into the career that I have now. I started immediately negotiating uh, manufacturing inputs and uh, contingent labor, uh, and it just worked for the way I thought. And I didn't have a background for it. I didn't have a business degree. I didn't come from a profession. It was somebody who knew me and knew what I was capable of and saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see at the time. And, and I, I, I think there are so many really great stories and kind of parables that come from that example because if you don't know, you know, you don't know where your next opportunity is going to come from. And you don't know if somebody who you might have the opportunity to impact can at some point affect positive change within your life, or you know, you don't know what the consequences of that are gonna be downstream. If I had not handled myself appropriately on the set, or if I didn't have the same phone number, or whatever, all of these combination of circumstances brought me to where I am today. And I think that that magic of seeing possibility and opportunity in other people is something that I connect really, really closely to. And I feel like it gets lost in the shuffle. It gets lost in the reliance on the resume or in the LinkedIn profile or in the, uh, in the work experience as opposed to the true potential of the individual. And so my why is really to kind of pr provide those same opportunities for as many people as possible. Um, and that's always been something that's deeply influenced my connection to the work I've done in all of its forms has been about creating opportunity and encouraging people to um, create opportunity for others. And that's really that's been my life. That, that's beautiful. That's really, you know, um, amazing journey from, from movies to modeling to, 
to to staffing industry. Oh my God! Let me amend that. I did not say modeling. That was not. <laughs> no, no modeling. Sorry, I take it back. No, I no, no. The, for some reason, I thought that you you did modeling. But, you know, won't be a bad idea. Trust me. You can you can go very far as a model too. So. <laughs> So, so Brian, uh, you just mentioned um, about resume, and um, you know I have heard you talk about your tagline, uh, finding a mission and not just a job. Yes. And uh, uh, you have chosen a mission, mission-focused career path um, uh, for yourself. So, yes. what is your new mission? Well, I think my new mission is kind of a continuation of, of, of that purpose that I just said about finding opportunity for all. I think that there are, we're at the chain, at the front of a, a great deal of change in the way work gets done. I think that there are uh, societal, uh, government, regulatory, technological changes that are going to influence everything and every, every tendril or everything that, that, you know, in how we live our lives. And what I want to do is I want to help organizations make sense out of that change and how uh, uh, and to expand their thinking about what's possible. And at the same time, recognizing that groups that uh, may not be able to per, you know, participate in opportunity like others are presented with that same opportunity. Um, I, 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 I grew up in a house where um, it was very obvious that uh, the difference between when opportunity presented itself and when it didn't, right? I mean, I, I actually um, I've spoken about this publicly before about how uh, some of my earliest memories as a child was to understand if somebody mispronounced our last name when we called, that was a bill collector and mom wasn't home. And then she found a job just similar to my experience. Somebody took a flyer on her and she had a career and she was able to provide a house for her, her kids. And so I see that and I, I think that the next way of working is about making that similar opportunity available to as many people as possible. There was a, a study uh, on um, CNBC just yesterday uh, that talked about how the benefit of the change or the, the, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, the white collar professionals have recovered for the most part from the yeah. effects of the pandemic and the downturn. But there's a whole other host of people who have not. And the, the difference is getting striking, so income inequality. And I think with the platform economy and the ability to work uh, anywhere in the world and how work gets done is presenting itself uh, for people who are in maybe disadvantaged areas or who are, unable, who are movement challenged to, to be able to really participate in the economy of tomorrow. And so I think that that to me is, is a mission I can connect to, is to creating a situation where we democratize the opportunity of tomorrow's workforce for as many people as possible and confronting those barriers to opportunity for everyone. So that's, that's what I think my mission is now. Um, in addition to, you know, being a, a good father and a relatively good person. Um, and then I also believe on a personal level that our job as people is to connect good people to other good people. And, and that's something that I'm really, really interested in as well is, especially now, the one thing that I have learned um, throughout this pandemic has been the power of connection and the, you know, just a simple phone call or just facilitating introduction and just forgetting about it. And you do it, you, you do it with no intention of gain on your own. Um, that's actually been one of the most satisfying things is, is connecting with people like you, with uh, you know, other people and, and what have you. That's been something that I've, I've really, really enjoyed as well. And, and it's something I hope to continue doing. So. No, this is, this is so great. And, and, uh, Brian, um, uh, for everyone who is listening, it means you have, I have experienced that, uh, in fact, uh, with you, I, we, when we talked, uh, immediately you started making some connections. You introduced me to Karen from, from Harvard business school and, we worked on on some some blogs together. Uh, it's amazing, amazing how you think connecting good people with uh, with with good people. It, it is truly and and the work we are in in the employment and the staffing industry Absolutely. that is so important because that's all that, that's what really who we are, right? We yeah. connect 
people to people for a job, for employment. So I think that's another reason we got connected very well. Rangam's mission is to promote employment for everyone. And when I that's heard right. from you that finding opportunity for all, that's your mission. I said, wow, that's, a, that's a, you know, that's right there. That is a it, it, it's such a privilege. It's a privilege to even in any way, shape or form contribute to someone's life in a material way. And, and yeah. this is something I, I used to talk about um, when I was advising enterprise buyers was the, 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 the deeper the connection to what you're doing, the easier it's going to be to elicit change. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, putting people to work or saving money, I always found the most powerful way to represent that was in the context of jobs that we're creating or saving. Right. Yeah. So when I did an initiative for, um, you know, for a, a small package freight, for example, when I was in procurement, I didn't talk about just the money that I saved. I talked about the jobs that I saved. We saved this many forklift drivers in our, uh, uh, you know, Cleveland warehouse, you know, those sorts of things. And that, that, uh, that puts things in very real terms and um, being able to create opportunities and put people to work is one of the, I think one of the benefits of this industry, uh, because through doing that, you make everything else possible. Someone can go to college, someone could uh, provide a home. Um, and I, I think that connecting to that purpose is really going to be some of the differentiation between uh, businesses that succeed and businesses that don't, you know, especially now, especially now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hundred percent agree with you means it's, uh, and, and especially now when we are kind of now over with 2020 and yeah. getting into 2021 and, and with, uh, uh millions of, uh, jobs lost, uh, talking about, um, this pandemic and, and during this time, uh, what is your, uh, what is the most important lesson, um, you have learned during uh, uh, this challenging uh, time? Well, uh, there's been so many. Um, I, I talked about the importance of connecting with people. And I think um, there's two things that I, I, I think are important to remember. Um, one is uh, not, not to expand, you know, the picture too much, but one of the things that is required for people to understand each other is the context of a shared experience. And that's why, like when I wear my 49ers hat uh, out, people say, hey, go Niners or whatever. It's a shared collective experience. That's why when you have a fraternity, they have a pledge period. That's why when you join the military, there's basic training. There are collective experiences that create a basis for mutual understanding. Well, for the first time in history, we've all globally had a shared experience. Yeah. Everyone's been affected by this positively, negatively. Uh, uh, they've lost people. They know people who have lost people. They've had challenges that have been heretofore unheard of by people in our generation. Yeah. That collective experience establishes a basis for understanding that I think that um, is, is going to be unique. And recognizing that in, is going to allow for people to connect and to really be curious about other people. And that leads me to the, to the second point, which is, um, this pandemic has very literally allowed us to combine our home lives and professional lives. And we see aspects of people that in the past have been not hidden, but certainly not obvious. And I think that um, being curious about people, who they are as individuals, in addition to their professional personas, um, has been something that has is, is really been a welcome change and, a, and a, certainly a significant learning. The power of that curiosity, the power of that connection of person to person um, is something that I, 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 I understood before, but now the power of it, I think, is really going to be a differentiator moving forward in the 2021, the humanization of the business relationship. And I think that when we talked about this, we talked about the, you know, before and yesterday, the purpose of mission and, and the connection that we have um, to our professional lives is expanding even broader. And I think everyone's going to find their own personal mission. Now that we kind of see what's truly important, what's truly, truly important, all the affective privilege and all these other things, you know, kind of fall aside when you're dealing with a global catastrophe. So uh, personal mission, talking about personal mission and, and uh, connecting people, I know you are a big uh, um, 
thinker on on uh, social capitalism. So tell us what is social capitalism and how do you see all of us playing that role? Well, I, I, I think that um, social capitalism is certainly not my term. There's a there's a very well known. Uh, hedge fund uh, called Social Capital uh, by, and I'm going to butcher the name, um, Pranith Chamadaya, I know I said it wrong, um, but he really is, is somebody who evangelizes the cause of business um, about as a mechanism for advancing social good, a social benefit. The social, so, instead of simply being about metrics and numbers and the accumulation of capital, he recognizes that business has a role in advancing social causes. Um, helping people find jobs or creating net benefits for society through healthcare or what have you. And I think that when we talk about the next version of, of capitalism, Jim, thank you for somebody sharing that up. Thank you. I, I'm going to butcher that name, but regardless, um, I, I think that uh, the next version of capitalism, as we come out of this, those companies are, that are going to really be successful in the long run are going to be the ones that recognize that simply uh, uh, turning a profit is no longer the sole purpose of an organization. They have to make sure they take care of their employees as well as their customers, and they're going to be looked at through the lens of their contribution to society as opposed to their contribution just to the bottom line. And um, it, it, we, we see that really in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and specifically with this industry itself, recognizing that the, like, like Peter Drucker said, the purpose of a shoe company is not to uh, make money. The purpose of a shoe company is to make shoes. In this industry, the purpose of, uh, of staffing, of HR tech or whatever, is not to do anything other than facilitate and remove friction in putting people to work. And uh, again, I can't think of a deeper, more socially just, you know, um, justification than than that, as I said before. So social capitalism, as I see it, is the next version of business that focuses not just on the bottom line, but the benefit to society. Oh, that, that's absolutely, that's so much applicable for the staffing industry because that's, that's what we are there. Right? It's not just uh, placing somebody or it's not just billing uh, our customer. It's about helping someone find a meaningful job and help them sustain when we talk about uh, people with disability, as you know, and I would love to lo uh, understand and, and get your thoughts on uh, hiring people on the autism spectrum, people, neurodiverse talent and people with disability. It's not yeah. about helping them finding the job. It's also how we nurture, how we create the right environment and how we help them to, uh, you know, so that they are successful at work. So that sustainability is a huge component of it. So share your thoughts on how do you see in the staffing industry, what are the things happening in there? I, I think that the, uh, and again, I want to call out the, the, the amazing work you do to support people with neurodiversity for sure. Um, mm. I, I think the, the, the role that industry plays is twofold. And, and, and one is education, right? educating people on this entire population of people with very unique skills and who have uh, certainly unique abilities to contribute to business success that don't exist anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and also a very hidden source of talent for certain types of things. So I think a lot of, a lot of industry is, is, is needed to be able to educate people to this population. And then two, and one that I think is actually more intentional, is to be an advocate for people in this situation. I mean, I, I have a connection to it. I have a family member, um, my, my daughter, um, who has had some struggles in the past. And, I, I, and, and th thankfully, she's overcome them. But I, I think that um, having somebody who is able to create a perspective of the possible for people and that there is opportunity, that they don't have to, uh, you know, be relegated to some other job or being dependent, that there is a possibility to be independent and do that. I think that is uh, the role of industry that we have um, to do that. And um, it's not easy. It's not easy to think outside the box, you know, and, and I, I think everybody can point to that little inflection point where you're able to um, realize that the, the fickle hand of fortune has 
tip the scales a little bit in your favor. I, for me, it was when that executive at Universal Studios called me out. Um, as an industry, we can be that person at scale. We can pre create opportunities in education and, and for this populations that have been, um, if not ignored, it's certainly overlooked. And so um, that, that, that to me is how I see it playing. And maybe it, it, it's just simply about making sure that uh, we provide them with accommodations so that they can work certain schedules or um, accommodating physical limitations that allow them to maybe uh, not have to work on the phone as much as somebody who hasn't or, or those other sorts of things. Um, but I think that, that's, that's, that's my perspective on it, Nish. I hope I answered the question. No, absolutely. And that possibility of, of opportunity, showing that possibility of opportunity, that is so powerful because uh, we have seen experience that that a lot of times, uh, you know, when you have a family member, you kind of um, underestimate their strength, their mm -hmm. abilities. And uh, uh, so when we as an industry, when we highlight these success stories, that is really helping parents to see that as a possibility of, of opportunity. That is so important. And, and uh, um, you know, uh, the way we see that as a staffing company and staffing industry, we can make or break. If we take that stand and say hiring people with dis disability or people with uh, on the spectrum is, is going to be difficult. And if we give up on, on yeah. that, that's that can be end of that. That's that's the role. Uh, I personally see that all of us, um, you know, have to play, uh, um, you know, and, and, and that. It, it, it really is such an important role and the consequences of it are, are so significant. Um, you know, when I was when I was younger, I was a big brother here when I first moved to L.A. I was a big brother for uh, a little boy in Lenox, California, which is a really um, disadvantaged town just outside of the LAX airport. Okay. And um, one thing that struck me about the time I would spend with him was that he lived less than four miles away from the beach, four miles mm -hmm. away from the beach. And he was 13 years old and he had never been there, never seen the ocean. Wow. And, I, and, I, and, and to me, that is a, a stark example of a worldview that creates a worldview. Your mm -hmm. possibilities are limited. Your perspective is limited. And the, and if we have any opportunity to expand someone's worldview, then we physically has changed a life, right? We've, we've really changed a life and not just that life, but the people around them, you know, that, that is the, that is a wonderful thing about education and a wonderful thing about the work that we do and the wonderful work that you do is to be able to create that sense of possibility or and disrupt the, the perceived limitations that they had. That to me is just a fantastic opportunity and a gift to be able to give to people. Yeah. You know? So Brian, yeah, this is the perfect example. Just recently during the Christmas time, uh, one of our uh, uh, customer part of Sourceable community, uh, we made a video from some of the people whom we have placed at one of our uh, employer partner. And um, it was so beautiful. I just literally had tears in my eyes every time when I saw. And in fact, when we share this video with our customer, uh, the leadership team and pretty much all the attendees, they literally just, because you, as you said, if you are changing the life, you are just, this is something which they have never experienced that. And that is a so beautiful thing. So I 100% I agree with you and, and um, uh, yeah. Um, Let's change some gears a little bit. I know you have mentioned something uh, about uh, um, democratization of the opportunities and equalization of opportunities. What is yeah. that? Well, <clears throat> the, no democratization, the democratization of opportunities is um, this phrase that to me speaks to how technology can create um, and be the great equalizer in opportunities when used correctly. Um, you know, in the past, uh, jobs were limited to people with certain backgrounds or who lived in certain geographies or had certain educational criteria. Um, now with technology, and especially now with remote work, um, you're no longer limited by people who might live in the Silicon Valley area. 
You're maybe you can think about engaging somebody in, you know, uh, uh, some parts of, of West Virginia that maybe you never had before. And I think that, especially now, um, with a lot of the, uh, the discord and, and a lot of the um, narrative that's going on about divisiveness in, in, in especially in the country, in this country, um, the ability to equalize and access to opportunity for everybody um, is something that's sorely, sorely needed. So when I talk about the democratization of opportunity, it, it's, it's the, the fact that technology and the workforce of today, um, it's possible for people to have much more equal access to opportunities to provide and to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, that includes recognizing the needs of diverse groups, um, people who are differently abled, people who live in disadvantaged areas, um, and recognizing that technology and structures can limit those barriers to engagement when mm -hmm. instituted correctly. So to me, that is, is the democratization of opportunity speaks to the ability for technology to do just that, uh, present opportunity for people who heretofore have not had it. And the challenge that we have for businesses and people who run uh, extended workforce programs is to look at everything through that lens in addition to the traditional supply chain concerns? Are we casting our net as wide as we need to? Are we considering all the types of people who could be successful in this role? Are we just only considering that one engineer who worked at this particular enterprise um, and, and has that certainty to it? I think that being with, a, and this goes back to the topic of today, which is you know, people in our industry have the unique ability to pursue business goals and social goals. And recognizing that the opportunities that you're able to create and present to the market, you want to expand it as wide as possible to give people um, the opportunity to, to pursue that. Because on a personal level, a professional level, um, going with the, the, the best candidate and the, the, uh, the one who just ticks all the right boxes is easy, but finding that diamond in the rough and changing a life is something that's a privilege. Yes, that, that's what I really like about this conversation. I've been learning a lot. So thank you for some of those great, um, you know, uh, thought leadership and how you see our industry, how you see our profession. And uh, you not only just, uh, uh, you know, talk about it, but you really, yeah, I have seen you uh, are leaving a mission, right? And and uh, that is that is so, so uh, impressive. So thank you for thank you. Any, any other, uh, any other, uh, thoughts as a thought leader and and uh, uh, um, the great uh, uh, flexible staffing uh, uh, strategies. Um, what are the new things happening? You know, strategy point of view in the industry to achieve this. You know, and and help companies become better social uh, enterprise. Well, I mean, how much time do we have? I, I think that. Um... We have about a couple of minutes, two minutes. Oh, okay, then, 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 I'll, then I'll do this real quick. I, I, I think that the, the welcome change has been the recognition of industries in the need to um, look at the extended workforce as an extension of their brand. You know, w when I was at SAA, um, we used to have the senior leadership meeting where we get, ca capture the CEOs and uh, senior leaders of the largest uh, staffing and professional services firms in the world. And we would always talk about how when we knew that the future of work was on the front of the Harvard Business Review, we will have arrived. Well, that time is now, right? We, that time is now. Future work is yeah. everywhere you go. And so now when we think about the opportunities that the market presents itself, um, not just to succeed commercially, but to succeed as a purpose-driven um, industry, um, that to me is going to be a welcome change. And, and another thing that I think is also a welcome change has been the recognition that for all of us to be successful, we have to collaborate. That's been something that is also a welcome change is that a lot of the siloization and competitive nature of the industry seems to have gone to the wayside and more organizations of all sizes are recognizing that as an industry, we succeed when we work together as opposed to at odds. And so those are the two things. Look for opportunities to be missional, look for opportunities to pursue your purpose and to recognize the importance of the candidates themselves and then also recognize the and pursue opportunities to partner for mutual success as opposed to trying to keep the pie for yourself. Rising tides can lift all boats, expand the piles, other sorts of things. Those are just some of the things I think are going to be strategic. And so the things I'm going to be focusing on in 2021.
Beautiful, beautiful. I love your vision uh, for future. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for all your time and, and wisdom sharing some of the, the great thoughts with us uh, um, for the new year. I think that that, that has been a, a, a perfect timing uh, for all of us uh, uh, here um, at Rangam and uh, all the viewers uh, who will be looking at these clips and and uh, start thinking on how we can really become a better um, mission driven uh, organization and absolutely human. so thank you for for everything and uh, thank you Nish. Uh, wish you uh, before we conclude before we conclude i i know we, it has been uh, we all know that the 2020 uh, has been very stressful and challenging year for everyone um, <laughs> this is how we 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 uh, look like you know this is what I we captured <laughs> <laughs> we the, so 2020 with this this um, uh, uh, you know um, picture it's I think it's we are almost there this is a bit the stress <laughs> on the left hand side and Brian on the right hand side but the future and 2021 we 2021 we don't want to look like that we want to look yeah. something like this. If you <laughs> <laughs> I love your hairstyle. Oh my God! First when I saw this picture, I thought it must be. Uh, uh, it's not real. It's not man. It is hundred percent real. What was the occasion and what? What, what is that? Tell us. Uh, that, that was a, that was a picture when I was thirteen years old. I think it was twelve to thirteen years old. Uh, my dad took it with my stepsister or my half sister. Uh, I, I I used to get stopped at the grocery store and people would just want to touch it. It was really kind of creepy, and I think nowadays that'd be a felony to touch a strange child. But back then, it was just uh, normal operating procedure sort of thing. Yeah, uh, you, you can see I don't I don't have that hairline anymore. <laughs> love it, love it. So nice talking to you, Brian. And thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. And again, um, wishing you, your family, a happy New Year, and have a wonderful healthy happy safe 2021 we will continue our conversation on empathy employment and innovation in in coming months and and years so thank you for all your time and wishing you all the best and thank you brian thank, thank you, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Shemika, thank you thank you thank you thank you amika